I'm glad everyone Hi. could make it. Thanks for joining me. You're very welcome. Absolutely. How's everyone enjoying the weekend so far? Okay, hey, anybody? <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, we, uh, this past weekend was great so far. Um, Friday night we had our, it was a CD release party that we threw, but not the conventional way. Um, I volunteered my back deck as a stage, and uh, we, had, um, we had about 10 people here in the backyard, and my neighbors all came out. They all invited other people and uh, it turned into a great old big old block party um you know you know it's like six yards but we played in front of a couple dozen people and everybody seemed to dig it we had a we had an absolute blast so uh um so far the weekend's been pretty good up until saturday morning when i had to wake up <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a lot a lot of fun and a you know great way for people to you know get out and enjoy themselves after and being cooped up for so gave, long we certainly gave it the best uh, effort, that's for sure. I got to give it up to the guys. Uh, they, they, uh, we all came through with, with uh, flying colors this past weekend. So despite some uh, early sound trouble, we, we pulled don't, it up. <laughs> don't get me started. All right, Jay, you're, you're, up, you're up next, Jay. <laughs> well, we had discovered that Mike's deck is actually an acoustic boom box that contributed <laughs> to all the bass frequencies, and uh, that, that worked out well. Nice. So I guess yeah. you guys will be using his deck for, you know, future shows and it's, events. It's possible as long as I don't drive my neighbors too too batty. It's, it should be just fine. But, uh, you know, I mean, we all, I, mean, I got elderly neighbors on each side of me, and they came out to their back decks and smoked cigars, had drinks, and they had, they had a great time listening to us. So uh, they loved it. So it was, it was, was cool, too. because so It was a good it was, thing it was acoustic, that's for sure. I know. It's <laughs> the first time that we actually played acoustic together. And we got together the past couple of weeks to rehearse and, and, you know, mess around with the songs and, you know, to find out that we could go out and play, you know, especially the new album, the whole album straight through, you know, acoustic and have fun with it uh, was, was exciting, you know, so that was fun. That's Not awesome. that, you know, I, I really didn't think that any, a lot, you know, a few of these songs would go over as well as they did uh, acoustically, you know, <laughs> pardon me. We didn't slow down Dying really to Live when we played that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Kill the Machine is the follow-up to the 2017 EP, Surfaces. And, you know, I have to say, it, um, it's, you know, eight solid tracks, no filler. So I want to congratulate you guys on the album. I really love it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you have to say, you know, um, the title track, you know, it's very... Um, melodic and rock driven but um i really love changing tide you know it kind of switches up the the feeling of the album and it's a very beautiful song so i wanted to ask you guys what's the story behind uh changing tide that's all awesome. don't ask don't ask mike because he's gonna call it the ballad <laughs> <laughs> now, i did want to say ballad but you know it's hard to you know find the right word for it it's I just have to say, you know, it has that, you know, feeling that it really hits you. As what the kids say, hits you in the feels. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a counterpoint to, to Kill the Machine in, in terms of the, the vibe of it. And I think, you know, we had talked about, you know, when we release Kill the Machine as a single first, you know, following it up with something that's going to give people, you know, an idea of what the whole album could possibly sound like. And, you know, Changing Tide definitely did that for us. But, uh, yeah. Anybody else? That song, well, actually, you know, that was one of the earlier songs we wrote when we were doing the album. And for a, uh, maybe a couple of weeks there, I wasn't so sure it was going to make it to the album. Hmm. But we, we kept hitting it, and it ended up going um, because, you know, we eventually finished the song. But at the, at the beginning, I, it, it was that song just kind of seemed like it was hanging around. And then we finished it. But where the ballad thing comes from is eludes me a little bit. I, I don't, I don't play it like a ballad. I know coming into the first verse, I am hitting a ride, which is even in the studio. Chris had mentioned that he's like, you know, going into the first verse, you're playing a ride symbol, um, which is just I, I don't know. I, I still wouldn't call it a ballad, 
but it's a heavy ballad. In, in compare, yeah, in comparison to the power rest ballad, of the album <laughs> right? that would be a cycle ballad. You know what I mean? Which, which almost scares me to say, like, wow, what if we ever actually did write a ballad? I don't know. It's a pretty song. It's a pretty song. I gotta yeah. call it. Yeah. I guess um, that's the right word to use. You know, it's yeah. So that you know, being the pretty song, I consider it a ballad. I mean, and I I, I told Seth because he started coming up with some pretty <laughs> some pretty riffs. You know, during the during the and I looked at him. I said, no, one pretty song per album. That's it. I'm not, you know, I, <laughs> let's try to bear with Joe and uh, Joe. What are your thoughts on uh, Jen? Ask what's your thoughts on. Uh, Changing Tide are. Changing Tide, I, one of my favorite songs to play live, too. Um, we've had that for quite a while. So, um, yeah, maybe definitely on the softer side of cycle, Cycle's material. But um, especially after we recorded it and uh, Chris just knocked it out of the park, whatever we did, um, took all the best features that everybody put into that song and just put it out. We were shocked when we heard it back. Because like I said, we had had it for a long time. We played it live. Sometimes we didn't play it. Sometimes we played it. And then, man, when it, be, when it hit the album, we were just all knocked on our asses. Yeah. No, like I said, it was the best produced, best produced song on the entire record, without a doubt. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, if that song was released when rock music was still played on top 40 radio, it would definitely be, um, you know, very radio friendly. On top yeah, of the we always have. Yeah. Um, another thing I noticed about the album is how insightful the lyrics are and, you know, the topics it touches upon, such as, you know, the opioid epidemic um, on Last Chance for the Saints. So my question for you guys is, is there an album or song that made you have a um, epiphany about life? or, you know, a revelation, um, whether it came to the lyrics, you know, leading you to have a real realization about life. You, you guys want me to take that one? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know it's you're kind the, of like a deep question. You're, you're but, the main uh, lyricist, brother. Right. It's so, all, it's all about stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing you're the main lyricist for the, the album. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm yeah, very yeah. blessed. I'm very blessed that the guys give me the, you know, the opportunity. It's something I've, I've, you know, loved to do since I was even a little kid, writing stories and, and poetry and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I've had a lot of experiences in my life, you know, good, bad, you know, difficult. I've worked in behavioral health for over 20 years, so I've seen a lot of stuff. Um, and to me, I think it's important that, um, you know, when people say they have writer's block and it's difficult for them to write. For me, is there's, there's just so much to pull from, and I think that. If you write in a way that isn't telling people exactly what to feel, but gives them an opportunity to feel um, from the lyrics, I think if you touch on things that are important, that are active today, I always say, you know, I hope I never put the word love in one of my songs because I think there's a thousand other words you can use that can say the same thing. Um, and I think what I, what I try to do is, and I, I was actually talking to Jay about this on Friday night, you know, when it comes to lyrics, is... I, th I think you want to give people an opportunity um, to understand how they feel about certain topics and maybe things they might, you know, they think of, but they don't necessarily think of all the time. And I think if you can do that and you can do it in a way that, um, and, and very blessed, you know, when it comes to writing the music, it's the real, it's the four of us in a room together. And the end, my inspiration comes from what we write together as a band. Um, and I, I want to make sure that the lyrics fit the music to the best way possible uh, so it stands up with the music we create and you know i'm always very grateful these guys give me an opportunity to write the lyrics and to see people actually li listening and reading the lyrics and wanting to know about the songs and what they're about and how how they've been crafted uh it's it means everything to me and i know it means a lot to, to all of us because i know that you know for a while lyrics became secondary you know for music and mm -hmm. the stuff that we grew up on in the you know 60s 70s 80s 90s um, it was such a big deal in in the music and, and how it moved people. Um, and it, it means a lot to me that I get an opportunity to do that for others. So, no, I definitely seen um, a change in what you said, um, the importance behind lyrics. So when I read lyrics from, you know, like you said, the 60s, 70s, 
I was yes. like, wow, it's crazy that someone wrote this. You know, it's yeah, yeah. telling a story who, and who kind of who, what kind of person thinks about that kind of stuff? It's it's I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Whereas Look, these days, top forty, it's just the same sentence over and over again, <laughs> meaningful know. or meaningless uh, lyrics over and over yeah. again. <laughs> We know what you mean. <laughs> we won't go into a many, million examples, but I know what you mean. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny. Seth always knocks it out of the parks with the lyrics. Um, and we'll hear it when we get back to the recording, just jamming the song. And then when you actually see them in person and can get every you know idea of what he wrote about, it's, it really does an amazing job always. So I don't know how he does it, but he does it. I think that's tough too, especially when you're singing in the studio. You know, I can remember years and years and years of people saying, take marbles out of your mouth and enunciate so people know what the hell you're saying. And I think even if you can do that, people are trying to listen to the music and they're hearing the lyrics, but I think when you can sit with them and read them, or even especially with the lyric videos we did, I think it's powerful when you can incorporate the lyrics and something visual and then the audio. I think people get a whole, you know, they get everything all in one package. And I think that's um, why it has so much more of an impact when you can put them all together. Yeah, it really brings it to life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That's the stuff we grew up on. I mean, you know, like you mentioned, the 60s and 70s. I'm sorry, Joe, I don't mean to step over you. Oh, that was it. Just uh, shout out to Nate. For making those killer videos. Yeah. Uh, the lyrics, that they jump right out at you. And it really captures, I think, everything that Seth wrote about it visually. And it just brings it to everybody. Hey. I think every, every song on the album has a, has a lyric, uh, lyrically has a delivery. Um, I mean, I've been playing with Seth for two decades. Shh. <laughs> and since I was um, 11 years old, <laughs> good which man, would, which would make me 30 <laughs> years old. I uh, uh, and it's it's never been a game for him. Um, it's it's he's been meticulous. Um, the, the the way that I'm not to get too far into it. The first time that I heard Seth was I was recording an album with another band. And um, I was in the studio, they had lost their drummer, and the engineer that was doing their album said, this band needs a drummer, let me play you something. And the first song that he played was, uh, Seth, what is it, the Easing Pain? Battery? Easing Pain, yeah. yeah. Yep. And um, I was, I, I don't want to use a dramatic word, but I was captivated by the lyrical content. Um, right away. I mean, it, it was a song about, you know, it was, it was a dramatic subject. I'll leave that up to Seth if he wants to tell that story because it is a close one for him. Um, yeah. But that hit me right away. And he hasn't veered off that the entire time. <laughs> the entire time. I mean, it's just always, it's, it's been a staple, you know? Um, and when Surfaces came out, people started to mention it. Um, and I'm like, man, I've been, you know, I, I guess maybe I took it for granted for a while. Um, but um, listening to all the lyrics on this coming album, um, I mean, I got to give it up for to Seth. It is just like it's not a joke for him. Uh, it's almost too easy, which makes me want to choke. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you do that? Um, but you know, because I mean, it, but it's a, uh, it's it's important to him, and and I don't think um, I don't think he I don't think he takes it for granted at all. I think it really does mean something. But the thing is, is that when I see people post things and say things about his lyrical stuff. Um, it matters to them, and in that regard, we're delivering something, um, and that means something. So that's more than you can ever ask for. Um, so, and I'm just a drummer. <laughs> I don't really <laughs> Gar garbage. I'm following hey, other drummers stuff, matter you know? too. <laughs> it's, uh, it's cool to be a mis fan and know that uh, you know that, that there's something else behind just the just the music. Um, the that the content and the lyrics are actually really you know touching somebody somewhere in some regard and people tell you when they do get touched. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. I always I enjoyed lyrics that's... that, I always enjoyed lyrics that made me think, like, you know, I, I, I touched on it before, like artists from the sixties and seventies, you know, they, they were the best. The lyricists, Freddie Mercury and Robert Plant, uh, 
you know, uh, Giza Butler. I mean, he was the main lyricist in Black Sabbath. Um, Ozzy as well, but uh, I mean, and you can go as you know into bands like Queensrÿche. I mean, right. they always had lyrics that made me think. You know, it, it, it can mean something, mean one thing. You could think it a to, you know in a totally different way, and that's what a lot what a lot of these songs are are. You know, they have always made me think, even when I try to interpret it in my own way. And then Seth actually tells a story behind it. You know, it's either right on or it's not. It, it, I mean, it, it's I you know. When when lyrics make you think, that's uh, and and Seth is is one of the best I've ever worked with, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I love you guys. Yeah, I was just gonna say <laughs> it's it's nice that your bandmates highly admire you. You know. <laughs> oh no, we treat him oh. terrible. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> this is all it's a facade. Trust me, because <laughs> you, you have no idea what I have to put up with. <laughs> Right, yeah, as soon as the meeting's over, just stop calling me names, don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't want to bounce around with duct tape off your head. <laughs> <laughs> I got a second also, uh, what Mike said about Geezer Butler. Um, those lyrics made me think I was about 14 years old, and I listened to Paranoid on headphones, and forget about it. Every, everything he said, it's just, whether it was Electric Funeral, Hand of Doom, War Pigs, it yeah. just, um, they had meaning to it. You know, so you project yourself back to when it came out, like 1970, um, just the whole, everything that was going on in the world at the time. It really yeah. kind of made you think, like, how they saw things, and, as opposed to everything was presented, say, with the, the 60s and the hippies and the flower power. Yeah. So really hit you. Oh, yeah. Everything he wrote. And I, I do hear, see a lot of similarities between Giza and Seth as far as lyrics. Lyrics. Yeah. War, War Pigs has, uh, there's a political message behind that that's prevailing. And right. unfortunately for Black Sabbath, they just wrote it off as uh, something demonic. And it was nothing of the sort. No. I mean, you really read those lyrics. They were talking about what's, what was going on, you know, yeah. in the world. It didn't pigeonhole, pigeonhole anything specific. It was just like, this is what's happening. This is how we feel. And, uh, you know, anybody who had any power to be like, we're afraid of that, they just said, and I'm not saying that's what, that's what we do. I'm not saying that. Right. Um, I'm, what I'm saying is that they just wrote it off as they're satanic or, or whatever they wanted to label them because they were afraid of the sincerity of the song. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And it's, it really is that simple. Yeah, I, I remember seeing in some movies, um, Oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the movie, but it's, um, you know, when the kids tried to go to the KISS concert. Um, Detroit Rocks. Well, yes. Detroit <laughs> yeah, and the parents were saying, you know, why do you listen to this music? It's the music yeah. of the devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's you know, crazy <laughs> right. to think, you know, 40 years ago, you know, right. KISS no, was my seen mom... as, you know, satanic, when now right. they're kind no, of, my you know. <laughs> my mom wouldn't let me watch Phantom, uh, KISS Meets the Phantom because she thought that, you know, because of the makeup and the pyro and all that, she thought they're, they're devil worshiping. It, it stands for Knights and Shining Satan. It's in, you know, you're not watching yeah. this. Knights and Satan service. Thanks, Mom. Yeah, right. <laughs> that only empowers a teenager. Oh, well, yeah. I wasn't a teenager. I was about six years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh yeah, we're not re we're not trying not to reveal our ages here, right? We're trying not right. to date it's ourselves. True. <laughs> <laughs> but we true. do get dis we do get discounts at movie theaters. <laughs> <laughs> if they're still open after the quarantine. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to um, you know, do a a fun uh, segment. Uh, it's called the lightning round. So I just ask you guys oh. questions and you just say what comes to your mind first. Should we figure out an order of how we should answer these because so we don't step on each other? Oh, yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> I guess we can start with Joe and then, you know, go. T I don't know if we're shown in the same order. So Joe, Mike, first. Jay, and then me. How about that? I got, my, I got Joe, uh, Mike, Jen, Joe, Seth, and then Jay. So that's all we'll do. We'll do Joe, Mike, Jay, and then me. Okay. okay. <laughs> All, All right. right. What was the first concert you ever attended? Leonard Skinner at the Orpheum Theater, Boston, February 1993, at 14 years old. What time was the show at, Joe? 
about 7.30, 8, <laughs> something more than that. I still have to take stuff, and still, to this day, I, I've seen a lot of college football. It felt like it was a movie that I watched yesterday. It absolutely blew my mind. My first concert, uh, my parents took me to, it was Ricky Nelson at the Warwick Musical Theater in uh, the summer of 1980. Is that right, me? Jay. That's okay. you. Um, earliest I can remember was a Beatles tribute band um, at, uh, I want to say the PPAC, and I must have been like eight years old, and that's as far back as I can remember. My first, you know, Big concert was, uh, I think, a Motley Crue concert when I was uh, in high school. My Nothing first concert there, right? <laughs> My first concert. I was eight years old, and it was Elton John at the Providence Civic Center. Oh, you guys all went to really cool concerts. <laughs> I'm too embarrassed to say who my first concert. No, was. you have to know. Oh, you God, have to say it. All right, <laughs> I think it was Avril Lavigne. Because my friend okay. had an, oh, wow. <laughs> my, my friend had an extra ticket and invited me. I must have been like twelve. Was she still in the? My goodness, the usually, you, age. you must be really young. Um, I'm thirty one. Okay, I'll be, That's I'll be thirty two <laughs> in July. So, not, in a few weeks, actually. <laughs> well, happy early birthday then. Yes, yeah. happy birthday. I would say um, my first really cool concert probably was um Def Leppard. When they went on tour with uh, Sticks and Tesla. <laughs> oh, nice! That was a cool. good tour. Yeah, I'm I'm very good friends with the drummer from Tesla. Oh, really? Cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really a cool show. It, it ended too quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So next question: Who do you consider to be the greatest vocalist, um, of all time? <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. Joe. Lightning round, buddy. Go, all right. So I don't the, the favorite. One of my favorites, I'd have to say, is seeing Robert Plant put back at the Royal Albert Hall concert from 1970. That's definitely released like 15 years ago. Um, he was just on fire. They were still a very young band, still hungry, and he just came up there and crushed it. Um, if you see like maybe years later, a lot of guys they don't have that same kind of fire on stage um but that that show in particular robert plant early zeppelin days i think might be my favorite steve perry journey best singer yeah. of all time uh Can't. no question uh best front man of all time freddie mercury oh yeah <laughs> ah. Fav favorite for me um would be uh, angelo moore from fishbone um because he, al he also plays baritone sax um, lyrics, performance, vocal ability, live. I don't know many people that can touch Angelo more. Maybe Perry Farrell. Uh, he's Jason in, Dixon. He's but, incredible. But I think one of the most underrated vocalists is probably Paul Stanley from Kiss. Yeah. He can sing. I mean, I, you can't, I mean, Steve Perry, I mean, Mike said Steve, I mean, you can't really, <laughs> you can't touch that. Uh, but uh, Paul, Paul Stanley is one hell of a uh, vocalist. Yeah. So my my God is uh, Freddie Mercury um, <laughs> on every level. However, um, a person I've actually been able to talk to kind of a lot, him and his wife, who's just an absolute sweetheart, um, J.R. Richards from the band Dishwalla. Um, they were big in the 90s with their hit, Counting Blue Cars. Uh, but J.R. Richards, to me, is probably the most underrated vocalist all time in terms of his tone and control. And he's a great lyricist. Um, and I've, I've been very lucky to even speak to him on, on several occasions. Um, and he's just such a great guy, but what a, what a singer. And that guy's voice is just unbelievable. But all time, Freddie Mercury, I don't think I can't even, I got nothing. Freddie Mercury is to me a God. Okay. Next would be, um, first CD you ever bought. Oh, this, we're going back to Fandango on this one. Yeah, like, right. Hey. Uh, we, okay, first, first, all right, let's, because again, we're going to be dating ourselves again. <laughs> we're talking first CD, first vinyl, first cassette, or your first overall album. I guess, uh, yeah, what, 
if it was like a vinyl, that can count as you know the first. Let, let Joe first have album. his answer, and I got answers. I got answers for all all four. <laughs> <laughs> Even eight track. <laughs> I never owned an eight track. I never owned an eight track. I just knew about them. <laughs> My father owned the eight track. <laughs> all right, Joe, you're up, buddy. Uh, first album. It was on vinyl for sure, but I had bought a couple, and definitely one of them was a Beatles album, an early Beatles. I don't remember which one. Another one was ACDC Blow Up Your Video on vinyl. I had so it was one of those two. I think I believe it was the Beatles. Um, but then, you know, tapes came out right. Started buying tapes shortly after that, but I believe one of those two was my first. All right, Mike. Uh, first album I ever bought with my own money is REO Speedwagon's High in Fidelity in 1980. I got it uh, with birthday money. Um, first cassette tape I ever owned, ZZ Top's Eliminator. First CD I ever bought with my own money was um, uh, Boston's Third Stage. And I, even, I actually bought the MB, MP3 of uh, the first download album i ever downloaded with my own i actually paid for it uh the white snake album from 1987 it's my favorite album of all time i had to have it in every format possible yeah. that it? you're on yep. Jay. um the first album i ever bought was uh peekaboo by devo of course it's gonna be nice. something weird with right um, wow that's, that's you cool I like that. it. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, I think in that same year, I, uh, I got the, an Eagles, because um, I had got a record player that year. So that's why I bought, I knew I was about to get a record player for Christmas. So I, I bought the Devo album pre-Christmas because, <laughs> but uh, for Christmas, my mom bought me an Eagles double uh, live set. It was like a trunk. It, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a famous cover. If you ever see it, you'll know it when you see it. First cassette I ever bought was Slayer's South of Heaven. No, I'm sorry, Rain and, Rain and Blood, which is the godfather of all thrash albums. Everybody should know that. Um, first CD I bought, I couldn't, I, I don't even remember, honestly. Um, the first uh, download I think I ever did was something live from Fish when I was going through my Fish <laughs> and, and Van stuff. Stage. Was that on like LimeWire? Remember those like Napster, LimeWire? Oh my God. <laughs> Napster, actually, yeah, yeah. It was actually Napster that I did the, yeah. the Fish album. <laughs> 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 All right, so let me think here. All right, so first, first tape I ever bought, so I bought three. Uh, it was, first one was Motley Crue. The second was David Lee Roth, California Girls, and ZZ Top Eliminator were the first. I bought all three at the same time. Uh, first CD I ever bought was Brian Adams, So Far So Good. A big Brian Adams fan. I love Brian Adams. He's awesome. uh, yeah, and the first download, oh God, the first download I've had was, I think it was 16 Stone by Bush. Not quite an eclectic taste here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Can, well, that's, uh, that's a pretty good uh, indicator on, of, you know, all the different influences that we have. Absolutely. You know, going into this. Yeah, if you look at my playlist, I'm, like, all over the map when it comes to music. <laughs> if you guys could uh, share the stage with any musician or any band, who's your... Uh, dream um collaboration i would say <laughs> living or dead you're up joe you know this is a band that would be currently playing or a band living or dead yeah living or dead living or dead lord um i would say doing a show with hendrix would be <laughs> pretty pretty damn cool I agree. <laughs> Mr. Kaz. Um, there is so many, way too many for me to even begin to mention, but I'll just, I'll just go with one of my favorite live bands of all time, Seven Dust. I love Seven Dust live shows. Uh, yes, sir. Energetic, still to this day. Um, just 
unbelievable. The vocals are great, just great and great people. Uh, had yeah. a pleasure with doing a meet and greet with them some years ago, and and great guys, very gentlemanly. Uh, I would love to do a show with Seven Dust. I've thought about this question. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you I had could, time, if I, <laughs> yeah. could, if I could jam one tune live at any point in front of a large number of people, it would be Ace of Spades with Lemmy. Nice. That would be the. That would be the. I love it. Out of everything, I'd say I want to do just that song in front of thirty thousand people with Lemmy, just so I can look in front of my drum set and go, "Dude, that guy." That is a great answer. That is a really great answer. That is a really great answer. (laughs) All right. uh, So. I'll give you I'll give you two, but I'll give you two different reasons why. So first one uh, would be Alter Bridge, uh, but I def- I definitely agree with Mike with Seven Dust. Those two kind of go hand in hand with me. However, uh, it's a band we had the pleasure of playing with in Providence. Um, that I would play with them eight days a week. Um, they were not only were they an incredible band, but they were good people. Is Blacktop Mojo? That mm-hmm. those oh. guys are just awesome, and I think we'd fit really well together. And we just had a blast with them. And they were just regular dudes, just hanging out, ha- drinking beers, telling stories, laughing. And just, they were just such good people. And yep. I would, eight days a week with those guys, I would love to play with them. I actually had the pleasure of uh, interviewing um, Matt uh, when they came to uh, New Hampshire. Very yeah, nice guy. Yeah, he's a very wicked cool guy. Yeah. He's a very cool yeah. guy. What a, what a voice on that guy, too. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. 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 I was just listening yeah. to uh, their cover of Dream On by Aerosmith. And unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. The fact they're, they're even better people, better. you know, the fact they're even better people just makes it makes it even better, you know. Um, but we had a lot of fun with those guys. From a musician's lens, um, watching them play was fun because they were having fun. Yeah. Right. And they were like halfway across, I mean, all the way across the country. They're from Texas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those guys, and it was like a bad snowy night. There was no parking. It was, and it was like a Tuesday, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and those guys got up there and killed it. They were like, wow, these guys are like, you know, time to go to work, I mean, time to have fun. And they did. They got up there. And so, uh, from a fan perspective, but also from a, a, you know, a musician's perspective, you watch those guys and, and you see something genuine and that's just, that hits home all day. Those guys, yeah. those guys got it going on. So. Yeah. You can definitely yeah. feel their passion. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. For the music. All right. Um, my last question. Um, what's the first country you hope to visit when you guys go on tour? If you went on like a worldwide tour, what's the first country you would want to go to? <laughs> Joe, it has to be a country that they'll let you back in the United States after after you're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's go with Amsterdam. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, that's great. The Paradiso. That's supposed to be the, the big venue over there. It's a blast. Heard all the good things about it. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to go with uh, either New Zealand or Japan. Uh, you know, just you just hear about the legendary crowds that are out, the legendary venues, Budokan, and, and places like that. Um, and I've heard so much great things about the audiences in, in New Zealand as well. So I think one of those two places, either New Zealand or Japan. Jay would not mind Japan. I know that for a fact. <laughs> I, uh, that's dangerous. I might not come home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll find me in some dark corner learning how to make swords from like some random old Japanese. <laughs> Yeah, be like, yeah. Right. He ain't, he ain't coming back. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree with Mike when, when he's talking about those crowds. Absolutely, and I'm gonna go with Brazil. Oh, mm, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, some of the 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 biggest crowds I've seen are, uh, I mean, people in Brazil. It's it's like hundred thousand, if not more, people. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I've no, seen a video of um, ACDC performing yeah. in somewhere in South America, and they registered the an earthquake. Yeah, the people were jumping <laughs> up and down yeah. with the devil horns and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. From South America, 
South American Hospital. Yeah, it's slamming. This was like 10 years ago. He absolutely crushed it. And the crowd was insane. Yeah. Amazing down there. So my choice uh, would be Germany. Um, I, Rock and Ring, and I mean, just uh, the crowds I've seen in Germany. And, and I had uh, a friend of mine who actually, one of my best friends and another friend of mine, were stationed over there, uh, one for nine years uh, in the military. And the stories that he told me about the venues and just people wanting to go out. It wasn't like you went out to drink and there were bands playing. You went out to listen to bands and they had booze. So it was a whole different mindset and uh, seeing those crowds in Germany. Um, but unfortunately, what I have to follow wherever these guys go, because I have to make sure that I can get them back in the, in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> I know they're very, yeah, they, they depend on me for that. So, but yeah, I think Germany would be my choice. Seth is going to be the, the, the dude who checks all our bags as we're getting on the <laughs> Like, I don't trust any of you. <laughs> I'll get over. You're the responsible one. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at me go. <laughs> you, know, you know what's scary, though? The day I do decide to just let it fly, boy, are we all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Joe, it's in your backpack. Nothing. Yep. <laughs> Nothing. You like, have to yeah. document this. It might be entertaining to watch afterward. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it will be. <laughs> We have a lot of fun together. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of doing it if it's not fun, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly, exactly. So um, is there anything else you want to um, you know, mention that you guys have coming up? Joe? What do we have coming up? Let's see. Well, we don't really have any gigs lined up at the moment, do we? Not until uh, October. Not until October. October was lit? Yeah. Is it about that's we're really looking forward to that. That's going to reschedule. That was supposed to be what? About May. A month and a half ago. Yeah, May 16th, I think it was. So we're very disappointed that that show didn't happen. We're really looking forward to opening up the lit in New Bedford. But it's back on, so we're excited and uh, can't wait. Um, I don't know what any other shows we even have lined up at the moment. There's nothing open, unfortunately, yeah. right now. There's nothing so. open yeah. right now. We'll be working on that. No Hopefully worries. Hopefully eventually. Yeah. We might just have another show out on the deck. Who knows? Right. It might be a, 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 the Kaz compound show, right? Yeah, or the com, co compound. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, check out the new album, Kill the Machine. It's um, out available everywhere, wherever you get your music. So um, please check it out. Okay. Yeah, um, I can vouch yeah. for it. It's a good album. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I, I would say us, along with, you know, probably many other bands, you know, a lot of shows canceled uh, on stuff like that. And it almost seems like the summer has been a bit of a loss. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to see what happens. Uh, it's it's tough in Rhode Island. Um, it, Rhode Island's a tough place to be a rock band. It, it really is. But that doesn't mean that the support isn't there. And we appreciate that. I mean, words can't even say it. Um so uh, we're looking forward to seeing where you know what we're doing now and everything else is going to go. Um, we're uh, <laughs> you know we're in it. So yeah, hopefully uh, by next year things will be back to normal and you know this whole nightmare will be over and we'll just forget about it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Let's hope so. So for me, um, let me throw out a, a couple of names. So we definitely want to thank uh, Chris Paquette. Um, you know, who we, we worked in the studio, uh, Nate Compton, who's also in the band Elysium. Check them out if you ever get a chance. They're a really cool band. Nate did such a great job on all our videos. And Shauna, yes. Shauna O'Donnell, who's done such a great job with us for all our PR and publicity and stuff. Um, she's just su such a sweetheart. It's so amazing at what she does. And we're very lucky to, you know, to be working with her. You know, and all of our, our family and friends and, you know, who support us. It's been two years of hard work on this album. And I know that we're all very proud of it. And this is just the beginning. I mean, it just came out on Friday. This this is what kicks off everything um, going forward. And I know we all look forward to shows and and having people hear hear the music and spread it. And I know we definitely look look forward to getting back and and, and challenging ourselves and, and having fun writing again. Yep. I want to give a shout out to uh, to Nina from Stole Cold Radio. Yes. Uh, she's uh, been a big supporter of ours since Surfaces came out. Um, and she does Boston rock radio. Oh, Boston Boston Rock Radio. Radio. I, why did I say Stone Cold Radio? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
she does a lot for local music in Rhode Island and it's tough and she knows it and she's in it and she, yeah. and she does a lot for a lot of bands. So I just, I, I just always want to give a shout out to Nina because she just does it because she loves it. Right. Yeah, yeah I actually met her um, in Rhode Island when I went down there a few months ago and yeah, she, huh. she was really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's sweetheart. We she's love a her. family member. Yeah, she's a yeah. big part of our family. Yeah. Yeah, and I also saw that um, Last Chance for the Saints was added to a, a Loudwire uh, playlist. So that's pretty exciting for you guys. Yes. To yeah. have two songs on that playlist, we, we had Changing Tide and, and now our, our third single. That For, you know, a small band working their way up, that's that's pretty incredible. So yeah, That's a great accomplishment. Yeah. <laughs> it takes you back a little bit when you you know you're, you're up there with you know trivium and a lot of the you know the other big cats out there so that's a that's a pretty cool thing to see that's awesome i'm really happy for you guys and you definitely Thank deserve you. it you know the like i said the whole album is amazing start to finish so thank you kudos very much. to you guys Thanks. tell all your friends oh i will <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, you know, once you guys are, well, once the venues start opening, you know, I hope people flock to the venues because they definitely need the support. Yeah, um, oh, I know. But, yeah, I, I definitely will check you guys out live. I'm really looking forward to that. Awesome. Yeah, come out and say hi. We'll, uh, we'll show you just how funny and fun we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your time. I know you guys got other things to do, but, you know, it's a pleasure chatting with you guys. Pleasure with you all too. My, ours. Yes, thank you so much. We pre any support and you know how much you've helped us, it, it gets us moving down the road. So we're we're very grateful. Awesome. Well, take care, guys, and hopefully we'll uh, catch up soon. All Absolutely. right, Jen. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.